Welcome to Longmont Voices and Vision, a project of Longmont Public Media. In the midst of the darkest period in our lives, when we're bombarded 24 hours a day with news of the coronavirus and the human and economic carnage it's causing in our society, we're challenged to cope with our fears and anxieties while remaining hopeful about what lies on the other side of this crisis. This project presents an opportunity for Longmont residents to share with others how they're adjusting to new realities of social distancing and the kind of future they hope to experience on the other side of the crisis. I'm Tim Waters, host of these conversations and a Longmont Public Media volunteer. In this series, I'll be asking Longmont residents, many of them your friends and neighbors, three questions. What are you doing to get through this crisis? Even though we cannot be together right now, how are we staying connected to friends and families? And what's the future you are hoping to see and experience on the other side of this crisis? I hope you'll stay with this series and enjoy listening to your friends and neighbors and learn from them how they're getting through and what they're looking forward to in a new reality on the other side. Kathleen McGoy, thank you for lending your voice and your vision to this Longmont Voices and Vision project. To get started, tell us a little bit about who you are, who you are and your background, what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for having me on this interview. My name is Kathleen McGoy, and currently I'm the executive director of a nonprofit in Longmont called Longmont Community Justice Partnership. We offer restorative justice as an alternative to the criminal justice system here in partnership with police. So with that background, you know I'm going to ask you three questions. The first of the three questions is in this unprecedented moment in human history that we're in right now. How are you getting through? Great question. So at this point, um, for me and the whole staff at LCJP, Longmont Community Justice Partnership, um, we are really tied very closely to the values and principles of restorative practices which really comes down to relationship. So in restorative justice, we look at what can we do when relationships have been harmed? How can we repair those relationships? But there's much more um, to it than just the repair that happens uh, after crime. Restorative values and principles can also be applied to promoting healthy relationships, building healthy relationships on the front end. So as an agency, as soon as the virus, the pandemic broke out, we started thinking, you know, what tools do we already have so that we could support people who are feeling isolation and anxiety um, and uncertainty. And fortunately, our tools can be adapted to connect people virtually and online. So one of the things that, I mean, I would say we're doing two main things as an agency right now. One of them is we can continue accepting cases from police um, when crime takes place. We can still move forward with the restorative justice process, but we've just shifted the whole thing to digital platforms. So we're utilizing our volunteers as facilitators to bring together victims and offenders, police officers and community representatives to look at what needs to be done to make things right. And the second thing that we're doing is proactively offering circles that are just relationship building circles. We call them connection circles. Every Friday, we have an appointment that volunteers, LCJP volunteers can plug into, and it's just a time where a question is asked and each volunteer is, each participant is asked to give their answer. And in both of those settings, what we're finding is that people are so grateful to have this opportunity to tell their story, to be heard, and to be able to find empathy and validation in shared experiences, even when we're physically separated. Well, that's a nice segue to my second question. 
that in a in a moment of unprecedented um, physical separation and social distancing that we've never experienced in any of our lifetimes. How are you staying connected with family and friends? I am just on a lot of video conference calls and phone calls. I have um, friends and contacts both within the restorative justice community and other networks that I know of where um, that people are really becoming very collaborative. So for example, in restorative justice, I just um, am in touch with a European forum of restorative justice practitioners who's asking, hey, can we get on a Zoom call because countries throughout Europe are actually considering how they can offer restorative practices to their communities on an online platform. So that's something that is, has always been important for LCJP and me personally to make sure that we are sharing our resources, sharing our successes so that others can use these tools. And now we're just doing that in a different way instead of you know, maybe meeting in person or talking about how to connect in person. We're just you, really using the same tools um, but in a virtual way to promote connection and, and um, any sort of resilience building is really what it comes down to at this time. So again, that's a nice segue to my, my third and last question. Uh, resilience is a way to kind of spring into this next question. And that is, uh, it's safe to assume, I believe, that whatever was normal before this pandemic uh, won't be normal after the pandemic, that what, there will be a new normal. Uh, whatever that new normal is, is one we're going to help to create together. So for you, what's the preferred future? What would you like that new normal? What would you like to see and experience in that new normal? Yeah, I think one of the greatest lessons that, that we all globally could take away from this whole experience is one, the power of what's possible when we are united in our efforts. And with that, the realization that we are all so connected, despite imagined barriers or separations between us, that really when it comes to a, a crisis like this, that the only way for us to get through it is to connect and rely on each other and realize that we have a very shared human experience. So what I would love to see whenever, you know, whatever the new normal entails uh, is more prioritizing of collaboration, sharing generosity, um, you know, people sort of letting down their guard based on our sovereign national borders or our perceived cultural differences and really opening up the lines of communication and realizing that, especially for our planet, the, the potential of the human race surviving really relies on how we come together to address the earth and how we care, not just for humans, but also the natural elements of, of the planet. So I, I mean, you know, because of my work, I think there's these really, we have these tools that we could already use to promote equal voice and kind of dissolve these notions of there's one truth or one person is more right than the other. I actually spoke to the Boulder High School Women's Empowerment Club yesterday and they were telling me how in their club they've learned that they can all have different opinions on issues but what they practice is listening respectfully to different opinions and not trying to prove that the club has to have one one position that they all get behind and i said you know this is <laughs> this is the answer you all are doing this informally as a club that how can we really learn to listen to each other and accept that we have different perspectives and different truths and still brainstorm solutions that are mutually beneficial and, and ultimately going to be good for future generations. Well, uh, lots to think about. Kathleen McGoy, thank you so much for your willingness to participate in this project. Take care of yourself and your family in this uh, time of um, social isolation. Thank you so much, Tim, I appreciate it.
Scott Converse, thank you for lending your voice and your vision to the Longmont Voices and Vision Project. Thanks Each for of these, Yeah, thank you. Each of these interviews have started with a little bit of information about the interviewee. So, you know, when people watch this over time, it'll be good to know who they're hearing from. So tell us about Scott Converse. Well, I um, grew up in Longmont, uh, uh, graduated from high school from here, uh, went off into business land, uh, worked for a bunch of large corporations and did some startup companies and retired probably coming up on 10 years now. And uh, when I retired, I moved back here um, to be near my family. And uh, we started some stuff like Tinker Mill, which is a makerspace here in town. So I was the original founder of that. And uh, when the Times Call left Longmont, um, sold their building, we started the Longmont Observer, which is a, a nonprofit newsroom here in town. And um, about three or four months ago, we made a bid on the cable access uh, PEG public access education government TV contract with the city and surprise won that. Um, so we are now running Longmont Public Media. Um, and that's what I've been doing now. I'm the general manager of, of Longmont Public Media and still for the time being the publisher of the Longmont Observer. And uh, we're conducting these interviews because uh, Longmont Public Media exists and won that contract. Yeah, so, there's some truth to that. Yeah. And this is one of those contributions. So thanks for your contributions, the many contributions to the community as well as this particular project. And that, that Longmont Pu Public Media, LPM, supports this kind of, of uh, a record we're establishing and outreach to the community. Uh, so on the record, uh, you know I've been asking people three questions in these interviews. The first is, um, in this time of really uh, unprecedented physical distancing and social, or physical isolation and, and social distancing, how are you getting through um, what is this unique time in our history? Well, yeah, it's kind of weird. Um, I'm an introvert by nature, so in a way, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, from from a, just being able to isolate, nobody thinks it's weird. I kind of like my alone time. But at the same time, <laughs> spent a, it, we spent a lot of time doing things um, out in the community, and that has been very strange, and dealing with that has been very odd. We, as you know, um, took over the Carnegie Building, the old library building, uh, when we took this contract on, and that had become really quite a – um, a hub of activity and a lot of it social because it's a media maker space. It's open to the public. It's available to anybody who wants to join and wants to start using equipment and studios and learning how to create media. And um, that stopping kind of so abruptly was sort of a shock. Uh, and uh, it, I had not felt lonely in a while. And that was, I felt, I felt lonely in the last couple of weeks and it's been sort of strange. I really miss the interactivity of um, having that space. So dealing with it really, you know, um, things like this, uh, there are an awful lot of Zoom and WebEx and Google Hangout meetings going on. Yeah. So, you know, that's one place that we spend time, but it's really, it's been very weird and kind of um, disorienting, I guess is the best word for it. Um, you know, before when I had a choice of when I wanted to be alone, and when I wanted to go do stuff, uh, it was, you know, it was fun. But now that I don't have that choice, I need to not um, go out when I want to, you know, just go out driving or go out storm chasing or whatever it might be. Um, it's a very strange feeling. It's, it feels constrained. It really does. Yeah. Well, your reference to all the Zoom meetings really kind of is a segue to the second question. Uh, none of us have ever experienced the isolation and the kind of disconnections that we're experiencing now. So we're all trying to find ways to stay connected to family and friends. So what's that look like for you? How are you staying connected to family and friends? Uh, th this is one way <clears throat> we're doing it now. Um, so we do a fair amount of this. Google Hangouts is actually really good for just one-on-one -on -one quick stuff. You just do it very quickly. You can do it on your phone, your iPad, your computer. Um, and also, um, I hate to admit it, but Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> Um, it is a, it is a useful tool, even though it has some weird things about it that are not so good. Um, and uh, texting, do lots of texting with people. 
and obviously phone calls. I, I do a lot more check-ins. I've been getting phone calls from people that I haven't heard from in a long time, which is very interesting. Like, are you okay? Do you need anything? A lot of that going on. And I do it with people too, a lot. You know, is there, can I help? I, I think that it's in, in an interesting way, it's actually brought us all closer together in some ways. It's, it's surprising to me um, and in a good way. I mean, I've heard from people that I haven't heard from in year, literally years. You know, you see them on social media and there's like that ethereal connection that's not really real. And then out of the blue now, in the last few weeks, I've gotten calls from a couple dozen people that like people I worked with at Apple Computer 25 years ago and, you know, stuff like that. It's just very surprising to me and um, actually kind of good in a way it's bringing us together. One of the things I've certainly heard through these interviews is that. Uh, while we're disconnected in so many ways, the conditions have brought us together in other ways that um, are, are equally un unprecedented as, as the isolation. The third of the, my three questions uh, is really based on the, the assumption that whatever was normal before the pandemic, there's going to be a new normal. Uh, we'll come out of this. There'll be another side or another side of this pandemic. And whatever the new normal is, the assumption is it's likely going to be different. Life will be different for all of us. So the question really is, what would you like to see in that new normal? What's your preferred future? What would you like to see and help create on the other side of the pandemic? <laughs> uh, my initial thought was to go into the dystopian view of <laughs> what, could, what it could be like. Um, but I would rather not think of that. And uh, I would rather... Uh, try to build something, which I do believe we can do. Uh, I think that um, the way to do that really is to start caring for each other a little more. Uh, I think that there have been a lot of realizations of shortfalls and shortcomings in our general societal structure that probably need um, to be addressed on a national scale. Uh, things like healthcare, you know, when you've got 20 million people who all of a sudden don't have a job, which is tied to their healthcare, during a pandemic, you got to think about, is this a good approach? You know, stuff like that. That's very important. Uh, and really taking, how do we take care of the people that um, were left out here? And there are a lot of people that were left out. So I think that I think that, that realization uh, with a lot more people uh, is, is becoming much more real. And I think that you'll see a lot of changes along those lines. In terms of what we can do locally, I think that better communications, I mean, what we're doing with LPM is um, creating a, like part of the information infrastructure of our community, making it much more open and available to people. This is a perfect example. This is something that would not have happened with the old regime uh, and the old way of doing things. And um, we want to enable this kind of stuff. And I think this pandemic has actually made that more likely to happen. The fact that you see, for instance, the late night TV show host guys, this is what they're doing for their shows. <laughs> they're doing it from their house, literally their houses with their kids running around in the background. I mean, that talk about um, people connecting uh, while being remote. I think you'll see a lot more of that. And that's something that, that um, the media world does specialize in. And I think people also are understanding the importance of uh, engaging with medium. So using it more, but also stuff like um, distance learning. I think you're going to see a lot more education happening, not like this exactly, but you're going to see a lot more people realize that they can go to college this way. They can, you know, if, if somebody's sick, they can stay home and still finish school this way. There's all kinds of stuff that um, people are realizing that very much that changed in a big way um, because of this isolation that we've been forced to, to go into. So I think you're going to see some really good stuff happen there. I do want to see our cities um, get better at um, communicating what's going on and to engage more. Uh, I do know that well, like, for instance, our city council last night, I heard um, that there's a, was it an $8 million shortfall? Was that the number? 8.5? Actually, it's 15.3 million as of, today, 15, as of this morning. 15.3 million dollar <laughs> shortfall. Um, that's a big number. That's something that people are going to go, what does that mean to me? So what, so I'd like to know what does that mean and what is the city going to do and how can we help? So I would like very much to help in terms of getting the city back on its feet and I think that uh, more people are going to be interested in doing that than they were before. 
especially when they see um, services that the city used to be able to do and afford, not be able to do and afford anymore. Uh, like Harold was saying, our city manager last night that uh, Boulder and I think, was it Louisville or Lafayette had started Broomfield. laying off? Say, Broomfield, Broomfield. Broomfield had started um, laying off employees, city employees, which you know surprised me. Um, I have heard from teachers in school districts who are afraid of the same kind of thing, although I think it's less likely because property taxes didn't go away. Although property taxes will probably drop with valuations now. So, you know, who knows? Yeah. So we'll see what happens there. Well, Scott, uh, that's a lot. Uh, and it fits into some of the other patterns we've been hearing. And uh, I hope residents, not only on this interview, but uh, we'll have a chance to kind of absorb those perspectives and those aspirations across the interviews uh, of their friends and neighbors who have been part of this project. So thanks to Longmont Public Media for supporting it. Thanks to you for your contribution. And uh, when we can all uh, re-engage face-to-face, I'll look forward to, to uh, our paths continuing to cross on a, on a regular basis. Thanks, God. Take care of yourself and your family. Thanks. Gordon and Pam Pedro, thank you for lending your voices and your vision to this project. Uh, to get started, why don't you just tell us a little bit about who you are? I'm Gordon Pedro. I'm a retired 72-year-old uh, white guy, <laughs> and I've had the privilege of basically following the distance guidelines that the health departments have been putting out and continue to do so. Well, I'm Pam, and um, Married to Gordon, obviously. I'm a retired therapist here in town and I'm involved in um, Recovery Cafe, which is informing a lot of what I'm thinking about right now. Um, yeah. Well, one day, hopefully, um, when people have all learned about Recovery Cafe um, and that will have grown into the kind of uh, asset in this community that, that we know it has the potential to be and should be, uh, folks will recognize immediately. And Gordon, I'm not gonna let you off the hook without acknowledging your, your 20 years of service to this community as our city manager. So whoever watches this one day uh, has to appreciate that as well. So you know, uh, three questions that I'm gonna pose to you. The first of those is, in this time uh, that's unprecedented in any of our lives, um, people are trying to figure out you know, how to make sense and how to get through. And my question to you is, how are you getting through this time of an unprecedented well, I'll start. I think we've really been trying to stay connected with friends and family. We've gotten really good at Rummy Cube and puzzles. Um, we've been checking in with our older friends, especially those who live alone and are widowed. Um, getting some exercise. I'm really enjoying doing some reading and writing and thinking. How about you? You know, uh, I would add that uh, in order for me to stay centered, I have to have exercise, so I begin my day early in the morning with a five to 10 mile hike, and uh, that starts my day off most of the time. And then in addition to what Pam does, uh, I am involved with a couple of small groups of uh, people who think and discuss things, and so we are engaged in various ways of sharing articles and ideas, and then we get together and uh, talk on Zoom once in a while. So in a, in a time that we've never experienced in terms of the physical separations and social distancing now we're all expected to honor, uh, how in that context are you staying connected? Pam, you answered a little bit of that question, but with friends and family, how are you staying connected with all, all those who you want to be connected with? Well, we've come to love Zoom. <laughs> we've really yeah. tried to use that and, and some FaceTime. Our son knows how to include all of us in a FaceTime chat. And so we've been doing, trying to do that on a regular basis with our kids. I belong to a group of about seven friends who are on a text thread. And we just check in all day long with each other. Someone will send a joke. Someone else will say, can you guys pray for me? I'm falling apart right now, that kind of thing. I have four younger women that I mentor that are in different states that I, we're still staying in touch through either Zoom or phone calls on, on a biweekly basis. Um, the other day we had to, a couple drive into our driveway and, and they sat in their car and we stood on the lawn and just visited for a while. I think we're still learning how to creatively connect. Lot, lots of that. I am involved in more phone calls than uh, normal because usually my way of communicating is sitting in coffee shops 
or in a small bar and having a beer and talking with folks. So now it's more needing to connect on the phone. Uh, and then we do have a situation where a couple of uh, my friends are uh, really compromised uh, physically. So they, uh, but they want to get together. So they have large backyards. We go separate by 10 feet sitting in the backyard in the sunshine and we just have conversations because they would like to have those conversations. Yeah. Well, uh, it's safe to assume, I think, that whatever, whatever we settle into is normal on the other side of this pandemic, life is gonna be different. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever the new normal is will be unlike what normal was before. So the third question is, what would you like that new normal to be? What would you like to see and experience? What's your preferred future as we move towards whatever new normal is? Well, we kind of agreed to go, that I go first on this one. I give, have given so much thought. I love this question, Tim. Thank you. Because I first realized that I've got some realizations that are, they're not new, but they're deeper to me right now. And some, some increased hopes. Um, going with your greatest hopes rather than greatest fears. It's been kind of fun to think about. Um, I think, so let me just talk, my realizations have been, um, I've been surprised at how much I'm enjoying this simplicity, this life. Uh, just the being home and spending time together and being in the yard and having time during the day to really call the people I wanna call or do the things I wanna do. Um, I'm finding that I can live with a lot less as we've been forced to look at what's essential and what isn't essential, even as I've needed to order some things, just thinking, how essential is this? And having that be a part of my paradigm that it hasn't been before. Um, another realization that I've had that's really hit me is, as I am sheltered in this safe home and as I'm washing my hands several times a day in my own sink, um, going to bed in my own bed, um, having food delivered to our home because I have an internet and I can order it. I think I've become more and more aware of how privileged I am. And, and that has increased my awareness of the vulnerability of the people who don't have those things in our world, in our community, around the world. Um, many people are homeless, mentally ill, they're in recovery. Our elderly friends who are on fixed incomes who don't know how to use the internet, um, and I think that, as I said, my recovery cafe involvement has now put faces and names and stories behind some of these precious people. And I've been realizing that in our most prosperous time in decades, we have totally failed this vulnerable population. And I think they suffer in prosperity and they, they're in despair when a crisis like this comes. So I think my best hope, the hope that I, and mine's really ethereal, like you said, I don't have specific, but that as a nation and a state and a community, we can recognize and reprioritize um, where we're putting our energy. Um, as you think of in fears and hopes, Tim, I'm, I've often thought about first and second things that if we prioritize those things that need to be first and then focus on the second things, we get it all. If we prioritize second things first, we often don't get either. And I think my hope come November is that we can begin to prioritize the vulnerable in our, in our world, in our communities, because when they're taken care of, then we're free to prioritize what we need to improve the world for the rest of us. And so I think that's gonna be a passion that I have as we come out of this, is to fight more for the vulnerable and um, at the risk of sounding political, starting to do that in November. So a lot of what Pam said is uh, very similar to my thinking, uh, the, group that I'm, the groups that I talk with, we are all basically in the same privileged category. We all have houses. We have the ability to distance ourselves because we don't have to go on the front line and work at a uh, clerk job or something where we have to interact regardless if we feel safe or not. And we can uh, wash our clothes and our hands and we can do all those safe things. That is a privilege that millions and millions and millions of people do not have in this country. And so I'm hoping we don't lose this opportunity that we have now come together and recognize collectively 
how we're all in this boat together. And if we don't all succeed, then in a way we all fail, but we know which group always fails more than the rest of us. Uh, going there uh, with this uh, recognition of the privilege of, that we have, uh, I'm gonna become a passionate advocate for those who are marginalized. And I just think that uh, uh, any of our society that does not help, have health care, can't get education for their children or themselves, uh, don't have a home and don't have the ability to actually deal with society. They are marginalized and I don't, uh, I don't wanna see them there from this point forward. And I think collectively we should do something about that. Inspirations for sure. And thanks for sharing those and who you are and how you're getting through this uh, pandemic. Gordon and Pam Pedro, thanks for lending your voices and your vision to this project. Thank Stay you. Stay safe. Take yeah. care of yourselves and your family. Thank you.